Hello. First of all, I want to thank Ivan for the invitation to be in this panel. My name is Daniel Sala. I'm a PhD candidate in social anthropology at Dalhousie University. The paper I'm presenting is titled Practices of Double Currency, Value and Politics in Rural Cuba. This paper is part of my PhD project that analyzes life in rural communities in western Cuba. My research pays attention to how farmers and rural citizens live within a regime of value based on monetary plurality. Here, I began to unpack this phenomenon. Consider the following vignette from a day in 2018 at a farm of one of my informants, a man called Mario. Mario and I arrive early to his farm some 80 kilometers south of Havana. The morning begins with a tractor operator, one of the nine workers at the finca, telling Mario that the machine is low on oil and cannot be used to plow. The reminder hits Mario like a bucket of cold water. He's been demanding oil for days from the supplies coordinator at his credit and services cooperative. Ideally, the cooperative should facilitate transactions with the state, including selling production and acquiring inputs. The fact is, however, that this month allotment is delayed, which is quite common, Mario emphasizes. Keeping production despite shortages demands Mario's full attention. Sometimes it's a matter of deciding what to lose. Quote, you lack the chemical fix, just a few days and there you go, thousands of pesos lost, end quote, he says. The day goes by, and in the afternoon Mario does some numbers. He missed plowing and weeding goals. He calculates salaries. All in all, it wasn't a very successful day. Just before going home, somebody from a state enterprise calls Mario, offering a canister of oil, quote, por la izquierda, unquote. This is by the left, meaning illegally. The price is high, but putting the tractor to work is worth it. They agree to the transaction and Mario hangs up. And then he says, quote, Okay, we start plowing tomorrow, but you know what? That is probably my oil he's selling me. Why won't they simply give us the oil that the government bought for us? End quote. As we call it a day, he reflects, quote, Man, this is complex. I only know that all this encabronamiento, meaning rage, gets reflected here. End quote. He says, pointing to his gut. This episode illustrates regularities in the farmer's experience that are rooted in broader histories of the Cuban agrarian sector. Now, in the paper I've given an overview of this history leading up to the current moment when private smallholders are the pillar of agricultural production while the state monopolizes circulation of inputs and food. Most important for my argument is a contradiction visible in the vignette namely, the contradiction between the moral good of producing food and the inconvenience and risk of doing illegal things. This, I believe, is a central component of the tensions Mario feels. Now, the question is, what analytical categories can do justice to these experiences? One possibility, often employed in recent studies of Cuba, is the concept of la lucha, the struggle. In the next section, I present a critique of this concept. I then consider an alternative framework around the notion of practices of double currency. And I also call attention to a phenomenon of incalculability interwoven in the economy. Mario's rage, I argue, is rooted in the fact that farms like his constitute frontline positions in the negotiation between different forms of value and calculation. Okay, let's take a look at the struggle paradigm and my proposal. There's no doubt that struggle is a key term in Cuban speech. Struggle has been described as evoking, quote, the illicit, the contraband, the clever manipulation of state systems and the adjustment to shortages, end quote. That's Wayne Rip, 2009. Per Tierra, 2011, says that all of the variables of Cuban identity seem to unite in the concept of a struggle the same way that all sort of people engage in the struggle regardless of their circumstances and opinions. The strength of the struggle paradigm lies in its ability to explain how the little struggles in everyday life are interlocked with the great struggle 
of the nation, namely the revolution, contributing to the reproduction of the state. For all its merits, however, I argue that the daily life model implicit in the struggle paradigm does not capture the gaps of livelihoods and life chances of contemporary Cuba. Over the last decades, state policy has moved away from egalitarianism. At the same time, scholars have underscored that social inequalities in the country are not accidents in wealth distribution, but outcomes integral to how the economy operates. We need to ask what are the structural relationships between the outward mobility of some and the disadvantages of others. Is struggle a good way to describe both? In order to consider these questions, I propose to think in terms of practices of double currency. This notion refers to an elemental feature of life. People need money to live, and they use it and think about it within and often against wider political, economic, and symbolic orders. Like struggle, practices of double currency serves to analyze everyday economic action. The difference lies in the more explicit way in which my concept calls to unpack what struggle keeps codified as a unity. This is the unity of the country as a single regime of value. This proposal is informed by the anthropology of value. It takes reference from authors like Bohannon, Moon, Graeber, and Marxian scholars like Turner and Harvey. It also shares the spirit of authors that have explored Cuban contradictions, reaching back to Fernando Ortiz's classic Cuban counterpoint. I stop here to turn my attention to money as an entryway to understand the architecture of value of the Cuban economy. The roots of Cuban monetary plurality lie in the partial dollarization of the early 1990s. The fall of the Soviet bloc and U.S. sanctions forced Cuba into a severe economic crisis known as the Special Period. As the economy contracted, the authorities made a point of protecting social services and employment. This allowed the revolution to retain substantial popular support, but produce mounting fiscal deficit. In the face of inflation, those who could turn to US dollars. At the same time, the economy needed to find sources of foreign exchange, which eventually included international tourism, foreign investment, remittances, and export of professional services, among others. Partial dollarization was adopted in 1993. The rationality behind this partial dollarization was to let the dollar in and then centralize its collection in order to subsidize some of the core institutions of Cuban socialism. This was a risky value conversion. It was risky in the sense that it depended on producing inequalities, capturing rents from those who had foreign cash and then using that revenue in a way that could neutralize the disrupted effect of inequalities. International tourism, joint ventures, and the internal dollar consumer market became articulated as a dollar sphere of value, which I call external reconnection. Side by side with this dollar network, we find the peso sphere of value, which I call contained reproduction. This peso sphere includes healthcare, education, state owned industries, the military, government, and agriculture, including private farming. Since 1994, the government began printing another currency, besides of the Cuban peso, the convertible peso. The convertible peso is disappearing today, and once again we see the US dollar and other foreign currencies gaining prominence in Cuba's internal circulation. Crucially, the exchange between foreign and local currencies operated at two different rates. And as a side note, I have to say that this dual exchange, dual uh, currency regime is being reformed in the last few months, and thus my analysis essentially refers to the previous policy moment until 2020. For private citizens, the exchange was informed in principle by forces of supply and demand. For a long time, during the 2000 and 2010s, the rate was one convertible peso, which was pegged to the US dollar, for 24 pesos. This exchange rate determined reality for average Cubans. It's in relation to this exchange rate that people say that state employees in Cuba earn, say, 30 or 40 dollars a month. But this exchange rate was only half the picture. The other half was the official exchange rate. 
the official rate put the Cuban peso at par to the US dollar and the convertible peso. This rate applied to firms and other organizations. One of its consequences was that neither convertible nor regular pesos were freely exchangeable for dollars within the state sector. This situation reinforced trends of top-down economic command by the government and split the economy into compartments. What I describe as a curtain of calculation separated sectors depending on the currency chiefly employed. For many years, these mechanisms allowed the central government to micromanage where the dollars went, and we need to remember that the dollars are the crucially scarce element across the whole economy. However, the enduring presence of these monetary arrangements doesn't mean that they produce a good measuring stick for the conduction of the economic affairs. Instead, what emerges on closer examination is a system that disrupts what Timothy Mitchell calls the, and I quote, character of calculation, unquote, that inaugurates modern money economies. In light of this, we can think of a politics of incalculability involved in the negotiation of ambiguous landscapes of value. Also, looking through the cracks of money practices, we can grasp an unacknowledged function of money, the function of blocking certain calculus and comparisons. Incidentally, this is not different from what money does more generally in relation to obscuring the value of social reproduction. So, entering to the final section of the paper, I return to the initial example at the farm to see how notions like practices of double currency and politics of incalculability can help to make sense of events there. Successful private farmers are what Julie Chu calls, quote-unquote, inappropriated others with regard to the symbolic world projected by the money system. The main reason is farmers belong to a productive and potentially efficient enclave within the peso sphere of value, but their pesos are not meant to either really represent economic efficiency nor give efficacy to such representation. In that sense, farmers are collateral damage in the politics of incalculability. In general, farmers, however, sell their crops for a decent profit, either to the state or private intermediaries. As a result, they experience private affairs as a relatively level value terrain. As Mario told me, quote, I work hard in the finca to go to Varadero, end quote. Varadero being Cuba's beach destination and symbol of the dollar sphere of value. Farms are placed on one side of what I describe as a curtain of calculation. At the other side, however, the state institutions also operate in pesos, but under different rules. The vignette presented Mario buying stolen oil from state employee, which made him angry for several reasons. To begin with, he felt that he had a moral claim over that oil as he would employ it to produce food for the people rather than speculate with it as the seller was obviously doing. But within the state's accountancy regime, Mario's pesos don't count as a real effective demand for these inputs. Because although nominally in pesos, the inputs contain dollar components in their trajectory as commodities. This puts farmers in opposition to officials and state employees at the local level. On the surface, this is a conflict over the control and employment of industrial inputs, tools, and machinery. More conceptually, we can see it as a negotiation around the definition of what counts as production of value, how production translates into money, and the extent to which money becomes capital. Ultimately, Mario's anger arises from his need to denounce the bureaucratic precaritization of his productive capital, which he not only defends because it's his own, but also because he can claim, with the support of state discourses, that it's socially beneficial. In conclusion, as I see it, this analytical framework suggests a research program that interrogates how different livelihoods fit in the broader architecture of value. This architecture, in turn, is not visualized as a superimposition of people, culture, state, and territory, as in the struggle paradigm, but as composed of a contradictory convergence of two spheres of value. On the one hand, the sphere represented in the regular peso, which I call contained reproduction, mostly associated with the reproduction of the socialist order. On the other hand, 
the sphere symbolized by dollars and convertible pesos, which I call external reconnection, predicated in transborder flows of products, people, and desires. With these notions, I aim to better capture the type of conflicts that give Mario that hard to describe burning in his gut. Thank you.